Hello, my name is Rajiv Badigir and I am an Applications Engineer at Cypress Semiconductors. In this first part of the two-part series, we will take a look at the basics of I2C and also what PSOC 1 has to offer for I2C communication. I2C, which is a short form of inter-integrated circuit, is a chip-to-chip, bidirectional, serial communication standard developed by Philips. This is an extremely popular interface and can be seen in most of the microcontrollers and peripherals like real-time clocks, ADCs, temperature sensors, and serial square prompts. Let us take a look at some of the basic features of I2C. It is a 8-bit communication standard with speeds up to 100 kilobits per second in standard mode, 400 kilobits per second in fast mode, and 3.4 megabits per second in high speed mode. It uses master and slave concept. There can be many masters and many slaves on the same I2C bus. But in most cases, there will be a single master with multiple slaves. It uses only two IOs, serial data known as SDA and serial clock known as SCL. Each I2C slave on the bus is assigned a unique address of length 7 bits or 10 bits. Master talks to a particular slave using this address. In this video, we will consider only 7 bit slave addressing. Let's first understand the physical layer. As mentioned earlier, I2C protocol uses a master and slave concept. It consists of at least one master and at least one slave. SDA of master is connected to the SDA of slaves and SCL of master is connected to the SCL of all the slaves. A very important thing to remember here is SDA and SCL lines are connected using a wired AND configuration which is done by putting the pin drive mode as open drain. This allows the master and the slave to drive the line low or release it to high impedance state but they can never drive the lines with a strong high. To get a logic high, pull-up resistors are placed on SDA and SCL lines. So when both master and slave release a line, logic 1 is obtained. Let's now understand the protocol layer. I2C transaction consists of a start, followed by the address and read-write byte, then followed by data bytes and finally terminated with a stop event. After the transfer of every address or data byte, handshaking is done using acknowledgement bit. As in the case of master and slave concept of other communication protocols, in I2C also, a transaction is always initiated by the master. An I2C transaction begins with master generating a start event. In this, a high to low transition happens on SDA when SCL is high. This directs all the slaves to get ready for the address, which will be sent right after this event. In most cases, slaves are addressed using a 7-bit value. These 7 bits form the most significant bits of the address byte. The 8th bit, which is the LSB, represents the read-write bit. If this bit is 1, it indicates that master wants to read from the slave. If it is 0, it indicates that master wants to write to the slave. In I2C, bytes are always transmitted with MSB first. As far as clock and data bit alignment is concerned, SDA line must be stable when clock is high. It can only change when a serial line is low. Let's take an example here. An address of 0x5a with a write option looks like this. You should note two important points here. MSB is sent first and SDA changes only when SCL is low. In I2C, for each byte, an acknowledgement needs to be sent by the receiver. After transmitting the address byte, master puts the SDA line in high impedance state, thus allowing the slave to respond with an acknowledgement, which it does by pulling the SDA line low. 
After releasing the SDL line, master generates a clock to read the ACK bit. If the transmitted address does not match any of the slaves present, none of the slaves would pull down the SDA and the line remains high. Master interprets this as NACK. A slave that generates ACK should release the SDA after the SCL line goes low. If NACK is received, master can either issue a stop command or reissue the start command. If ACK is received, master can proceed with the read or write operation. In the write operation, master starts writing data immediately after the acknowledgement for address is received from a slave. On completion of each byte, master releases SDA and clocks in ACK bit from the slave. A slave can send an ACK if it is not able to receive any further data. In this case, master can either terminate the transaction or keep sending data to the slave. Stop condition is used by master to terminate the communication. It is generated by pulling the SDL line high after the SCL. In a read operation, when master receives ACK on the address byte, it releases the SDA and starts generating clock pulses on SCL. Slave device writes the data to the SDA on each clock. When one byte has been read by the master, the slave releases the SDA and master now generates ACK or NACK on the ninth clock. If the slave does not have any more data to send, it releases the SDA line. After this, if master keeps generating clock pulses, it reads 0xFF as the data. When master is done reading, it generates a stop command to end the communication. Here is the summary of basic I2C data flow which we just saw. In a write transaction, master sends a start followed by address and write bit. The slave with an address match responds with ACK. Master then writes the data bytes and slave generates the ACK or NACK for each byte. To stop the data transfer, master sends the stop. In a read transaction, master sends a start followed by address and read bit. Address slave responds with ACK. Master then sends clocks on SCL line to read the data from the slave. For every data byte read, master generates ACK. Master then sends a stop to end the communication. There are several special cases in I2C. First, let us take a look at the repeated start condition. In repeated start, master generates a start without issuing a stop for the previous interaction. This allows the master to keep control of the bus for the next transaction. This is useful in case of multi-master I2C communication where other masters in a bus could try to gain control. Let us consider an example where master wants to write one byte data and read one byte of data. Here the master can either initiate two separate transactions, one for write and one for read, each terminated with a stop, or it can perform a single transaction using a repeated start without issuing a stop after the write transaction. Another special case is arbitration. Arbitration is required in all communication protocols where the communication medium is shared. In I2C, as there can be multiple masters, arbitration is required. The rule here is, master devices connected on the bus should always monitor the bus state. If the start condition is issued by one master and the bus becomes busy, the second master should not try to talk until the first master releases the bus by issuing a stop. But what happens when multiple masters try to start the communication at the same time? To understand the situation, we must first understand the concept of clock synchronization. All masters generate their own SCL clock. Thus, when two masters try to communicate at the same time, it is necessary that clocks from both the devices are synchronized. 
Let's consider clock 1 and clock 2 generated by two masters. SCL is clock observed on the bus. Each master uses counters to decide the logic 0 and logic 1 duration of the clock. Let us call these as logic 1 counter and logic 0 counter. For the sake of easy understanding, let's assume that master 1 first pulls down its clock. At the same time, it starts its logic 0 counter. Due to wired and logic, SCL is pulled down as well. This forces master 2 to pull down its clock and start its own logic 0 counter. Logic 0 counter of one of the masters will elapse first. Let's assume it is master 1. Master 2 clock is still at logic 0. So master 1 has to insert wait period in its clock till master 2 clock goes high. When master 2 clock goes high, the logic 1 counter in both the masters are started simultaneously. When the logic 1 counter of one of the masters elapses, the SCL line is pulled low again and the process repeats. In this way, clocks from both the masters are synchronized. It is interesting to note that the logic high duration on the SCL line is decided by the master which has the lowest logic 1 counter period, whereas Logic low duration is decided by the master which has the highest logic zero counter period. It is also necessary to note that clock synchronization is also performed by the slaves on the bus. Slaves hold the SCL line low till they can process the received data. I2C spec allows the slave devices to do so to match its speed. Effectively, the logic high duration on the SCL line is decided by the fastest of the masters and the logic low on the SCL is decided by the slowest of the masters and the slaves. Let's come back to arbitration process when two masters try to start communication simultaneously. The clocks are already synchronized in masters. Arbitration is achieved using the SDL line. If during communication, if any master sees the discrepancy in the SDA state, as compared to what it is driving with, it exits from the communication. The other master continues with the transfer. Consider this example, where two masters start communicating almost at the same time. Everything looks fine till A. Data produced by both the masters are same. However, when master 1 drives high with master 2 driving low, the STA line remains at logic 0. Master 1 sees this discrepancy and loses arbitration. It exits the communication and waits for the bus to become free, which happens when Master 2 issues a stop command. This way, bus arbitration is achieved in I2C. Now let's have a look at what PSOC 1 offers for I2C. PSOC 1 has a hardware I2C block which can implement master, multi-master and slave function. Some devices have two hardware blocks which can implement two I2C interfaces simultaneously. It is compatible to industry standard Philips I2C specification. It supports communication speed of 50, 100 and 400 kilobits per second with 7-bit addressing mode. Various flavors of I2C user modules are available in PSOC Designer. These user modules allow the user to work with I2C without having to go into the details of hardware level implementation. There are three user modules for I2C in PSOC Designer, Easy I2C, I2C Hardware and I2C M. Easy I2C implements slave with a firmware layer on top of the I2C hardware. This user module is the simplest one to use. It allows the user to set up a data structure in the code and expose that structure to the master. All I2C transactions happen in background through interrupts. The only thing user needs to do is to update the structure with the data to be sent and process the data received from the master. I2C hardware user module can implement slave or master with or without multi-master capability. Unlike easy I2C, I2C hardware user module requires code to handle read and write buffers and to check the status of transactions. 
I2CM user module implements master in firmware by manipulating the GPIO pins. It does not use the hardware block. As it is firmware based, it makes use of 100% CPU bandwidth during I2C transactions. In the second part of this series, you will learn more on the user modules and how to create PSOC designer projects. You can also refer application note AN50987 which is getting started with PSOC 1 I2C for more details. Thanks for watching the video.